It is lovely to be together again, especially when we are, we are perilously close to freezing. It's just, I love the heat wave we're experiencing. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4 as we continue our series through the book of Luke. Today, we're, we're, we're looking at a longer passage as we enter more and more deeply into the life of Jesus. And in particular, today we get to experience the homecoming of Jesus. He has been, as you remember from last week, out camping for 40 days, but forgot to pack food. And now he is headed home, one would imagine, for a home-cooked meal. I'm thinking Mary put out a pretty nice spread for Jesus. It says in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, that Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about Him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When He came home to the village of Nazareth, His boyhood home, He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the Scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to Him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll and handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by his gracious words that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb, physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown like those you did in Capernaum. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent instead to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha, but the only one healed was Naaman, a Syrian. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd on his way. As I finished reading this passage, I couldn't help but think of a meme that I've seen a few times. Uh, that escalated quickly. And, and I find myself reflecting on this passage with a couple key questions. First, why does the crowd react so violently to Jesus? Like, Three verses before, they, they, they're speaking well of him. And then all of a sudden, he quotes some Old Testament facts, and they try to throw him over a cliff. The second and, and connected and more important question is, what is Jesus saying about himself? If you, if you reflect on the story, something really interesting happens. And, and I have to say, just on a personal note, as I reflect on the story, I, I, I find myself wondering about my own sermon preparation. You know, Jesus, he, he is praised by everyone in Galilee. That's a region of about 200,000 people at the time that Jesus was alive. So 200,000 people think Jesus is all that and a can of beans. And he, he goes to the synagogue. Scripture says it was his practice. It was as usual to read the scriptures. And the, pro, 
The scroll of Isaiah is handed to him when he gets up to speak, and Jesus, he reads one and a half verses from Isaiah, sits down, says, Scripture's been fulfilled today, and everybody says, wow. Now, this is a rhetorical question, but would that be all right? I feel like I could prepare a sermon quick if all I needed to do was read one and a half verses, and you would all be in awe. And in fact, apparently, as Jesus is, this was apparently Jesus' custom, 200,000 people thought it was amazing. It makes me wonder, why do I preach the way I preach? This seems so much simple. It also makes me wonder, what were all these, what were all these other teachers preaching like if Jesus... Anyway. But something is fascinating here, right? Jesus, he, he's in this synagogue. He's, he's at his hometown. Mom and dad, maybe you're there. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say. Certainly people he grew up with. People who have known him for most of his life in an earthly sense. Are filed into this synagogue. And you wonder kind of what the, the hubbub is like. Scripture tells us that Jesus became notable in Galilee and then arrives in Nazareth. So he's sort of like coming back home after he's gained some fame. And you you wonder, what was the discussion leading up to that Sabbath like? Hey, did you hear Jesus is coming? Yeah, my cousin over in Capernaum said it was amazing. He was doing miracles. Jesus? That guy? Have you seen his chairs? it's, It's hard to really put yourself in the place of what it would have been like to sit in that synagogue on that day. Because in a very real sense, the people of Nazareth, they had a unique experience with Jesus. Did they not? Imagine that you saw teenage Jesus. And then you saw that same Jesus doing miracles. I mean, it's a unique experience, to say the least. For all of those in attendance at the synagogue on that day. And then I I want to really focus our time this morning on the, the things that Jesus emphasizes in his hometown synagogue. One would imagine a synagogue that he grew up going to. A synagogue he went to, uh, filled with scrolls, where he first came into contact with words he uttered in another life and form thousands of years before. I mean, it's, it's just it's a fascinating situation and moment in time to think about. And he's handed the scroll of Isaiah at that point. You know, the, the, the library was out of the hardbound, leather-bound books. They just had scrolls on display. He's handed the scroll of Isaiah. And I think it's fascinating to spend a moment thinking about Jesus' choice. He's given the, the whole scroll of Isaiah. And he flips, or I guess turns to, or, or opens to, yeah. I mean, I get, it's hard to really imagine... Rolls to the very end of the book, quoting Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2a, first part of verse 2. In all of the book of Isaiah, I mean, lots of options. There's 60 plus chapters in the book of Isaiah. He, Jesus focuses in on this just handful of lines. This is the way that he wants to present himself to his hometown. This is the way that Luke, the author, chooses to frame the first sermon he'll ever record Jesus having spoken. This is the way that Luke thinks that the people who have come to faith throughout the Roman Empire during the the, the 60s AD when this gospel was being circulated, this is the sermon he wants them to hear about Jesus or from Jesus. That the Holy Spirit has led this verse, this sermon. So let's consider it. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, that the time of the Lord's favor has come. If you read the book of Isaiah, you'll find it, it, that the last part of the book is filled with what had become known as messianic prophecies. So, Jesus would have grown up and generations of his peers, Jews, would have grown up reading the end of Isaiah, reading the chapters that surround in this chapter itself, and and absorbing this as what they should expect from the Messiah. These are messianic prophecies, part of this messianic element in the book. Jesus kind of goes to the heart of these messianic prophecies. And this, this is the thing. And after reading this verse and a half, he puts the scroll down, he sits down. I really appreciate the fact that you got to sit down to preach back in Jesus' day. (laughs) Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Jesus is, in effect, declaring himself Messiah. That the expectation of his people for these prophecies was being fulfilled. At at minimum, if you wanted to be as, as generous as possible with the comment that Jesus makes here, you could say, maybe Jesus is saying there is the Messiah is among us, rather than simply claiming to be Messiah. That's the least inflammatory thing you could construe Jesus' comment as. That Jesus is saying that the Messiah is here this very day. But it seems that the people took his words as if he was talking about himself. And I would suggest that is how we ought to. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. So there is, it seems, in the synagogue, there is this time of response to the words of Jesus where people are are moved in a positive way by his choice of Scripture and his interpretation of that Scripture and even his troubling declaration in their, from their perspective for a time. But then you can almost imagine you're sitting in that crowd and, I don't know, maybe a boyhood rival or, or uh, some other carpenter from the town that had a business competition with Joseph. I don't know. You, you, you fill in the picture how you will, but someone begins to say, well, wait, hold on a minute. How can this be? Verse 22. This, isn't this Joseph's son? I spent a lot of time staring at that phrase. Isn't this Joseph's son? Yeah, there is an innocent way to take that phrase. That, that the people are saying, well, I mean, it's just Joseph's kid, right? That, that's probably the innocent way of taking the phrase. But I, I would... I would hope you would consider perhaps the story that we've read in the book of Luke till now. Jesus' birth, his parentage, was anything but common. It was not, certainly from an outward place, a wholesome looking origin story. Mary, his fiance, found pregnant. Joseph, he, he, he starts, when, when the word first starts to trickle around town, Joseph starts, his buddies might remember, you know, that, that he had tried to, to break things off, but then suddenly he had a vision. He had a vision, and, 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 and so he decided, oh, you know, I, I am going to marry her. But we know from the story, looking back, that things perhaps weren't so great, Mary flees Nazareth for most of her pregnancy to spend with family in another town. When they arrive, Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem, Joseph's hometown, not a place is found for them to stay. 
Think about that. A woman is pregnant. She's in labor. Your cousin comes to town. There's no place. Your, your brother comes to camp, town. Your, your relative comes to town. And there isn't a bet. No one's willing to move. No one's got a, a living room. No one's got a, a rooftop. No one's got any place for a woman in labor to have a baby. And you very much come away from Luke's story with a sense that there was tension between the people that surrounded Mary and Joseph and the parentage, the origin of Jesus. And so when Jesus comes home and is preaching and is claiming to be someone special and is impressive to the people around the, the, the region, someone says, isn't this Joseph's son? And I hope you'll pardon me if I read that with somewhat of a scathing tone. If I imagine that there was some murmuring in the synagogue that day. Oh yeah, remember Mary? When, when did she, what, how, how long after they got married was she pre- Wait, is it that Joseph's son? Jesus, it seems, whether it is patently obvious due to the discourse happening in the synagogue that day, or he has... Uh, he understands and perceives the thoughts that are running through people's heads, addresses it. He says, and you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself, meaning do miracles here in your hometown. But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. And then Jesus he, he launches into what seems like a pretty basic Old Testament history lesson. He says, Certainly there were many needy widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the heavens were closed for three and a half years and a severe famine devastated the land. Yet Elijah did not send to any of them. He was sent to a foreigner, a widow of Zarephath, in the land of Sidon. And many in Israel had leprosy. Well, let's, let's just focus on the widow of Zarephath. So, if, if you look in your Bibles, you'll find in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, this story recorded about Elijah and his time with this widow from Zarephath. Elijah has just declared over all of Israel a years long famine in the name of God. And after declaring that famine, he flees at God's direction, to a brook, the Kareth Brook, and stays at that brook, getting um, uh, Amazon Prime uh, drone via Raven deliveries of food for a little while. But then the brook dries up because it hasn't rained. And so the Word of God comes to him, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 and 9, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. Why does Jesus bring this story in? So, Elijah, if you follow the story along, he goes to Zarephath. He meets the widow. He asks her for a cup of water and some bread. And she says to him, Lord, she says, I swear, verse 12, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in my house. And I only have a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this meal, and then my son and I will die. Maybe God could have picked a better Airbnb on that day. But Elijah said to her, verse 13, Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do what you've said. But make a little bread for me first. Then what's left, prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and crops grow again. 
And she does as, does as Elijah says, makes bread for him. And sure enough, for the, for the rest of the famine, there is constantly this, this presence of flour and oil in this widow's home. And then after a time, the widow's son dies. She comes to Elijah broken. Verse 18, O oh man of God, what have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins and kill my son? But Elijah takes the boy, prays over him, breathes into him, and the child's life is returned. The woman tells Elijah, verse 24, For now I know you are a man of God, and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Why does Jesus cite this old story about Elijah to this muttering and murmuring crowd? And I think we can glean from the second story why that might be. And furthermore, what in the world relationship does this have to do with a prophet not being accepted in his own town? And the verses that he chose to read from Isaiah. This seems like a very random assortment of Old Testament things to sort of mash together. Why does Jesus go here? So, second story Jesus cites. And many in Israel had leprosy in the time of the prophet Elisha. Now, Elisha was the apprentice, if you will, of Elijah. So, just a short time later. We find that story in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5, Elisha gets pulled into Jesus' sermon through reference. It says, The king of Aram, this is 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Now, this story is interesting. We find out, in 2 Kings chapter 5, that Aramean raiders were going into Israel. Aram at this time is north of Israel. And in fact, Aram, just to sort of help understand the relationship a little bit, Aram and Israel are at times in the history of God's people enemies, but later somewhat become uh, uh, allies of convenience because the Assyrians who are further north are trying to take over the whole region. And the, so the, the, the Arameans, they uh, almost function as a, a border between Assyria and Israel for a time. And so there are times when they're in conflict. There are times when they are, are some kind of allies. In this case, they are in conflict. The Arameans, we find out, verse 2, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel. Among their captives was a young girl who was given to Naaman's wife as a maid. Oh, I, I did want to mention, as I was thinking of Aram, I found, so, there's this steel called the Tel Dan steel. It was discovered in 1993 in northern Israel. And it's the oldest reference that is not from Scripture. So the oldest extra-biblical reference reference to the house of David. And it's dated about the 9th or 8th century BCE. So somewhat, I mean it's hard to put a date on it, but somewhat uh, analogous to the time that we are reading here in 2 Kings. There is this steel and on it it's constructed by and erected by an Aramean king, but it references the house of David in Israel. Just just a freebie archaeology for you. Anyway, so this enslaved Israelite girl tells her master's wife that she wishes he would go see the prophet in Israel to be healed of his leprosy. And so Naaman, he goes to his king, who we've already read is a big fan of him, and he, he asks about it. And the king apparently is a big fan of Naaman, he says, well, I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. 
Remember, these are nations. Aram is raiding Israel actively, but the king of Aram says, all right, you know what? Go for it. Let's send you to the, pro- to the prophet down there in Israel. And he sends Naaman with this letter of introduction to the king of Israel along with gifts. Verse 6, he says, With this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. And the Israelite king, he receives Naaman, he receives the letter, and I want you to see how he responds. Verse 7, When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, Am I God that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But Elisha kind of gets word of what is happening here. The man of God, he heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay. He sent a message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. And so Naaman goes to Elijah. Elijah sends a servant to talk to him, tells him to go swim in the dirty Jordan River seven times, and he'll be healed. And Naaman's like, forget about it. And then as he's leaving, his servant kind of gives him a hard time. And like, well, you know, what's the big deal? Just dip yourself in the river. Naaman dips himself in the river several times, seven times, and is healed. And finally, after being healed, Naaman and his entire party, verse 15 go back to find the man of God. And they stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servant. Elisha turns it down. His servant has other ideas. It's a whole mess. But that's really not the point of Jesus' reference. Why does Jesus bring these stories up? Why do people get so infuriated by them? And we can extrapolate a little bit from the stories. Because these are odd stories. Jesus, we read, clearly says that there are widows in Israel at the time that he sent Elijah to a widow in Zarephath. Why does God send Elijah to that widow rather than the Israelite widows? And the only thing that that makes sense, especially since Jesus relates it to the story about Naaman, is that the only widow that God could find who would receive and feed Elijah during this time of famine is this widow from Zarephath. She was the only one who was going to be faithful and obedient. And we know that's the case because that's the same thing that happens in Naaman's story, right? There is this prophet Elisha in Israel. And at the word of his slave girl, Naaman is willing to go across enemy lines to find this prophet. Not only that, his king, the enemy king, is willing to send him with a letter of an introduction and a lavish gift to sort of smooth over the whole, we've been raiding and stealing your villagers thing. Just for the chance that his commander can meet the prophet of God. Now when you contrast that with the king of Israel, who when he finds out the man is a leper and has been sent to be healed, he doesn't, the king of Israel, he doesn't say, oh yeah, just go see Elisha and things will be fine. He tears his clothes in dismay. Whatever am I to do? Am I God? So you have the Israelite king who has no faith in God or his prophet contrasted with the Aramean king and commander of the armies that are attacking Israel that are willing, they have faith enough to cross enemy lines to soothe over political uh, distress, we'll call it. Jesus has referenced two stories where God's people, you know, those from God's hometown, you might say, were unwilling to be faithful and obedient and trusting of God. And so God was forced, 
His only option was to work through this pagan woman, this Zarephath woman, this widow from Zarephath. God's only choice is to work through an Aramean king rather than the king of Israel. Through this, the only ones that he could find that were faithful. God had, you might say, for the widow of Zarephath, for the leper Naaman, he had some kind of blessing. He had something he could do. Food for the hungry. Healing for the sick. But the only people at those times who were willing to accept it were pagans. Jesus, he he says to them, look, I'm here to proclaim good news, to set captives free, to to give sight to the blind, to to free the oppressed, to, to announce favor. I'm here for those things. And as he is declaring that's his purpose, his hometown, well, they say, isn't this just Joseph's son? We're not even sure about his parentage. <laughs> and he, he's the Messiah. He wants to free captives. He wants to heal. Jesus is saying through these stories, through this, through this uh, uh, passage in Isaiah, look, I have come for a specific purpose. I have, I have a gift. I have a blessing that I want to give people. But apparently, it's really hard for God to find people who are willing to accept that blessing. For Elijah, he was sent to Zarephath. For for Elisha, it was offered only to a foreign enemy commander. Jesus, looking at those he has grown up around, finds himself in the exact same position as Elijah and Elisha. With blessings that his old family friends, loved ones, siblings maybe, they're rejecting. Jesus is saying to those in that synagogue, he is saying to us, Today, simply this, that he came, he has come with good news, with freedom, with truth and favor, but only for those who accept him. Are you willing to accept what Jesus has for you? I don't know about you, but I, I could use some freedom. Freedom from, from debt. Freedom from fear or shame or guilt, from sin. I don't know. I watch the news occasionally. It seems like there are people who need freedom from oppression. It seems like there are people who need the truth. There seems like there are people who would really go far with just someone that had favor for them. Seems like some good news would be nice every once in a while. Jesus has all of that. Only if we are willing to accept Him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for this first sermon. We thank You for being the one that comes with freedom, truth, with favor, with good news. And we accept You today in Jesus' name. Amen.